And they were used to create these wonderful pedal cars. Morris 8, this is a Series 1 Morris 8. You get a three quarter view of that glorious Sunbeam Talbot dropout. It's just a stunning little car. Just the Talbot Samba. And here we've got a Mark II, a standard. Is this an 8 or a 10? Good morning. This is the four cylinder Wyvern. Oh, here's a nice one. The Austin A105 Westminster, the Van der Plath version. Love these old Saddler teapots. Well, morning folks and you find us today in Morton Hampstead, a small market town on Dartmoor. We are in sunny Devon, we are several miles to the west of Exeter, that's the largest big city to where we are now. And this is the Morton Hampstead Motor Museum in a former, I think it's a former bus garage, a 1930s bus garage. What a stunning old building that is. Only enhanced of course by the presence of this Wolseley 1500, look at this, a 1964 Wolseley 1500. We only saw one of these yesterday, and that's other garage we went to where we spotted three Austin A40s. This is the owner, we've just had a quick chat with him, this belongs to the owner, he's just starting to open up. We are a little bit early as always for this kind of thing. Brilliant car indeed, so we will uh, go for a walk into Morton Hampstead itself, and then come back a little bit later this morning when the museum is open. And then we will have a walk around and admire the many exhibits which I believe are hidden away in this phenomenal old building. What a cracking old building that is. Yeah, I'm assuming it's an old bus depot, judging by the height of the door there. But yeah, what a great place to have a car museum. And a lovely little Wolseley Park outside the front. Just strolling down the high street now, we'll go and find a, somewhere to have a cup of coffee. And once we are suitably fortified by caffeine, and no doubt a sausage roll or two, then we will go back up to the museum and have a proper look around there and see what gems we can find. But yeah, just a quick look at Morton Hampstead itself. This is one of very few towns anywhere around here, so it's a really thriving little place, I think. folks we are inside Morton Hampstead Motor Museum we've actually come up to the first floor because it's a little bit quieter here at the moment the museum has just opened so let's have a quick look around and see what we can find up here to begin with a little Austin this is an Austin 7 the very early minis called Austin 7s 1960 Austin 7 mini saloon this one was kept by its previous owner since 1982, been subject of a sympathetic restoration completed in 2009. What a lovely little car that is. Looks like Farina Grey. Apologies if it's looking a little bit yellowy. The camera's making it look a little bit yellowier than it probably is. But filming indoors is always a bit of a challenge. We'll have a look at these wonderful old motorcycles in a bit. We've got another Mini here, a Shorty. Looks like one of these cut down minis, roof, folding roof on it as well. That's an unusual sight. But next to this glorious Mark 1 Austin 1960, we have one of the derivatives of the little mini, the Wolseley Hornet. What a cracker that is. Again, some good information in the window. It's on a DTT registration, so that's a local registration number. There's a history. Oh, 
That's a beautiful little car that is. Like I say, we're in Dartmoor, this little town and this motor museum within it. We're in Dartmoor, so it's a bit of a run to get here, but it looks like it's well worth the trip. Next to the the metro, an eight registration metro, we have a Barclay, a little three wheel Barclay, is that the T60? Fairly sure that's what it is. Let's have a quick look again. A very welcome information board here. Yeah, 1959 Barclay T60 Roadster. What a little cracker that is. All sorts of different cars in this building. Like I say, this used to be a, I think it was a bus depot, this particular building. A slightly later Mini there. Another room to have a look in shortly, but let's stick with this. Next up, we have a Messerschmitt a K200. Well, that's, a, that's a better kit, that is. My life with a Messerschmitt K200. Well. <laughs> you can see the aircraft inspired lines on the Messerschmitt bubble cars. You can certainly see the influence there, can't you? <laughs> Next to that, another classic German bubble car, the BMW iZetta. This is a 1960 iZetta 300. Bond bug, the 700ES, alongside that. And what do we have here? Is this an Ape or a Lambretta delivery van, 1959? Look at that. Three-wheel commercial versions. From 1949, commencing with the 125 FB. This vehicle is an example of the FL, FLI 175, a model built from 1959 to 65. This Lambretta was imported into the Netherlands around 2000 and restored there by an enthusiastic former owner between 2009 and 2012. That's a very groovy little machine indeed. Yeah, reminded me very much of the old Piaggio Apes. A little reliant here. Just the Robin. Everywhere you look, there's just more and more rooms. A nice oil cabinet here. The 1945 BSA M21 AA road service combination. Back at home, I've got one of the original pyrene fire extinguishers off one of these. It's actually got AA embossed on it. That would have been fitted to the, the sidecar body itself where all the tools were kept. That's the kind of thing, the old pyrene fire extinguisher. And an Evershore filler can as well. The best design ever of petrol can, in my humble opinion. You never lose the spout because that hinges, you unclip that end there and it hinges here and it folds out and that becomes your pouring spout and there's a filter built into it which is really, really clever. These were popular I believe with the, the Works Mini rally cars in the early 1960s. They used to have one of the, probably the two gallon, that's the one gallon one that we're looking at there. But yeah, a really clever design of petrol can. And over here facing the AA BSA, we have one of the old boxes, the old phone boxes for AA members use of an RAC alongside and an RAC motorcycle combination part over here. Oh. The Norton in this case, so the other was an M21 BSA. And here we have a Norton. Loads more memorabilia here as well. Oh, across some really tasty little mopeds here. I'm going to have to resort to looking at the, uh, the information sheet. We've got a Norman Nippy, MSK859, that one's from 1960. Norman were based down in Kent. And if you had a look at the Dover Transport Museum video that I did a couple of years ago, there's a huge collection of Normans down there. So please check out that video when you're finished with this one, if you haven't seen it yet. Not quite sure what we've got on the end there. I can't quite see that one. 
loads and loads of memorabilia. Harley's downstairs at the moment, but I know he'll like to see this lot when he gets up here. We've got a Phillips Gadabout, this one 1960, same year as the Norman Nippy. And the Solex, the Velo Solex. If you watch the Mr Bean film where he was in France, he had a, he had a ride on one of these, engine over the front wheel, driving the front wheel. And next to that we have a Cycle Master. So that was a small engine that was built into the rear wheel, so you'd swap out the entire wheel. Put some controls on the handlebars and off you go, but they had to be road registered. There it is there, the engine built in to the rear wheel. It's very clever, very clever design this one. Lots more memorabilia here. Some old bicycles, a Royal Mail bicycle there. A rally, or the rally, 1947, a rally sport. And a BSA Dandy of 1957. Well, if any of you watching this video remember riding one of these, or indeed any of these little mopeds and engine assisted cycles. And then on the end, a Brockhaus Corgi, a paratroop vehicle. You'd lob these out in the back of an aeroplane, parachute down, unfold it all, and off you go. I just have to have a look over here. What is this wonderful tin plate, motor bus, or omnibus? I know some of them want this. Castro motor oil cabinet there, complete with all the glass bottles. Very, very nice too. More Castro memorabilia, oil tins, oil pourers. Look at all those, wow. His lordship's going to be very excited when he comes up here. We've got a gorgeous tin plate racing car just on the top there. Yeah, lots and lots of wonderful memorabilia. I love this school sign as well. Right, so let's carry on through here past the M21 and the Krypton diagnostic machine. Holtz display cabinet there. I wonder how much of this memorabilia was sourced from local garages. Oh, look at these pedal cars and a pedal penny farthing, a small penny farthing, a miniature penny farthing next to this pedal car. The pedal car was based on the Mark II Ford Zephyr, unless I'm very much mistaken. This is a Triang circa 1920, it says. Vintage pedal car, wooden body and steel chassis. I'm sure many of you will know what this is, the Austin J40. These were built by Austin, they set up a small manufacturing facility in South Wales and former miners who had to give up work through to health conditions, they actually built these and Austin sold these. It was built up from offcuts from the actual main manufacturing plant at Longbridge, where the main, well, the A40 Devons, vehicles like that of the time, were used. So the offcuts were shipped over to Wales, and they were used to create these wonderful pedal cars. Quite heavy, these are. The early ones were slightly heavier than the later ones. I think they used a thicker gauge of metal. We used to have a couple of these. One was an early one, and one was a late one. And the weight difference was noticeable between the two. The early ones also have a flying A, like, just like the real cars, on the top of the bonnet strip there. But it was decided that that was probably a little bit unsafe for kids, because they were quite sharp, so that was deleted on slightly later cars. But these were produced, I think probably from the sort of, about, I'm not sure, 1950 thereabouts, up until about 1971. They had quite a long production run, if I remember right. Many, many of them were sold as well. This is a 1971. What a great thing that is. There was also the, you might well remember, there was also the Austin Pathfinder pedal car, which was produced at the same time as these when they were first launched. But they were only built, I think about 1947, 48, something like that, and the Pathfinder was a pedal racing car. And that was a real, real beauty. Those are really sought after nowadays. 
because they only made them for a year, 18 months or so, so they're really hard to find and priced accordingly. Even a good J40, you're looking at, what, £4,000 now, something like that. A few more old Triang toys over there. Another pedal car there. All sorts of goodies here. Scooters. So what's this one? Lambretta 150. Someone asked for scooter coverage a little while ago, so here you go. And a BSA Sunbeam. This one, a bit rarer. You often see Lambrettas and Vespers. But not so many of these. The BSA. The BSA Sunbeam Scooter. Very, very cool indeed. And on the end here, we have a Sun. I've seen Sun bicycles, but I'm not sure if I've seen a Sun scooter before. There's a bit of info here. Bicycle maker started production of 270cc and 590cc motorcycles. Yes, of course, Sun motorcycles. So this is 1959, 175cc Villiers engine, electric start scooter with foot change fully restored. On loan to the museum here, at Morton Hampstead. Yeah. Various motorcycles over here, lots of books, and memorabilia of course. A cabinet here full of many gems, I like these bulb holders. Yeah, various little motorcycles, lightweight motorcycles, Hondas up there. A Motor Guzzi, that's a smart looking one. Who remembers the old Honda 50s and the Honda 70s and 90s? This 1968 Honda C90 in as found condition. I mean, how many millions of those are made over the years? Really, really neat little design. Very reliable. Surely some of you watching this video will remember only one of these. Let me know in the comments if you've had any of these little mopeds or motorcycles in your motoring career. Lots of AA memorabilia here. Including some early AA badges. I'm still trying to date an early AA badge that I've got, which is very similar to that one at the top left there. Right, well, next to the Lambretta van, we've got this gorgeous vintage AC Tora. So what year are we looking at here? Mid-twenties, I would guess. Solid disc wheels, as you can see there. Let's have a look at the information sheet. It's always good to have these information sheets. 1924 AC Royale. 12 horsepower, open Tora with dicky seats. Previous ownership since 1958. There's the blurb if you wish to pause the video and have a proper read of the history on this particular AC. Beautiful aluminium coachwork on this. Very nice, proper slotted screws as well. None of these cross headed screws here, thank you very much. quite a comprehensive dashboard for a fairly small car of the 1920s that's actually quite a well-equipped dash another cycle master there like I say you could mount that back wheel in any suitable bicycle of the era this one's in a triumph frame a bit of vacuuming downstairs and here we have a glorious Sunbeam Talbot drop head coupe we see something a bit like this on some of the events we go to uh, in our area of course we're down in Devon at the moment enjoying the many many classic car finds by the time this video goes live I will have actually uploaded a video of our week here in Devon classic car hunting if you've not seen that video yet I'll include a link to it at the end of this one but trust me we've found some really interesting vehicles now this is dates to 1939 drop a coupe 10 horsepower wow. lovely lovely car 10 horsepower that was the 
an RAC rating that was dreamt up before the war and used for motor taxation purposes. It was a formula based on the, the diameter of the cylinder bores in the engine. And on that basis, that was that, gave, that calculated how much you would pay in road tax. That was dropped, I think, in the late 1940s. But for many, many years, that's how the, it was rated, the horsepower rating. Nothing to do with engine power or brake horsepower. It's purely a calculation for taxation purposes, and it was dreamt up by the RAC, probably in the 1920s, if not a little bit before that. Lovely interior, four-seater. Isn't that wonderful? What a great little motor museum this is. Well, I say little, it's not actually that small. There's a, I think there's about 150 different vehicles in here. So if you ever find yourself in Devon, I would heartily recommend heading over to Dartmoor and Mort Morton Hampstead itself and just come and have a look at this museum. It's on the main road in the town. And this is probably the oldest car here, 1905 Wolseley. Proper London to Brighton. Is this just about qualify as 1905? Hmm. Classic vehicle restoration show 2014. Most interesting car. It was voted. Certainly, probably one of the oldest. Look at these old uh, petrol pumps here, motor spirit pumps. These will date 1920s, I would have thought somewhere around about that. Prior to that, fuel was distributed in the old two gallon petrol cans that we see dotted around in various museums and antiques fairs and so on. Oh, there's the entrance, we're just over the entrance now to the museum. The, window, the door is open rather. That gives you a bit of a clue as to what we'll be looking at downstairs shortly. And I think this is a Wolseley, yep, 1922 Wolseley 7. The 7 is that 7 horsepower rating that I was talking about before. Of course, the most famous 7 of all was probably the Austin 7. Although technically, if you actually work out the size of the cylinder bore on the Austin 7, if memory serves, it comes out at 7.99 horsepower, so it should really be the Austin 8. It shouldn't really be called the Austin 7, but it was. But this is Wolseley's rival, if you like, 1922. So that was the year that the Austin 7 came out. So clearly Austin thought he'd have to try and grab a slice of the market in the small car market of the early post-war years. Prior to that, people were driving around in funny little cycle cars and on motorcycles, but that wasn't for everyone. So cars like this bonny little Wolseley, the Austin 7, the Rover 8, cars like that were all introduced to try and really appeal to motorists on a budget and it was cars like this that enabled so many people to take to the roads and enjoy holidays in their motor car days out day trips and so on most previously they would have always been reliant on charabangs that kind of thing and just over the way from the lovely little Wolseley is this AC a really a really original looking AC very similar to that AC Royal that we saw before this has beautiful patina. Hopefully the camera's picking that up. But lovely, slightly aged, faded paintwork on this one. Very, very nice indeed. Lovely smell. It's a shame you can't smell this, but lovely smell from this old leather interior. A bit of oil, leather and wood. A great combination. A beautiful car. And in the back here, hiding behind that opening panel there, you've got the dicky seat, or as the Americans would say, the rumble seat. So you whiz that open, and you've got another seat back, and you can put your feet in the back there, and there is the step to clamber on board. Lovely original roof material as well on this one. Got a sort of yellowing rear window there. Just a beautifully preserved vintage AC. What a cracker that is. I do like that. Of course in this era it was nickel plating, not so much chrome plating, it was all nickel. Stunning honeycomb radiator there. Yeah, proper 
Bobby Dazzler. They've got another pyrene fire extinguisher on the running board there. Beautiful car. Next to the AC we have this wonderful Riley again, a vintage car. 1928 Riley Wentworth, 11.9 horsepower. A stunning, stunning car. I think it's really good to see these nice early cars in this motor museum. People say the interest in early cars, pre-war cars, vintage cars is on the wane, but I beg to differ. I've spoken to quite a few people this week who are big fans of cars of this era. Yes, they're a bit... They do need a little bit of getting your head around sometimes if you're used to classic cars of the 50s and 60s, but if you're tempted with a, a vintage car, go for it. And there you go. They, they can see on the Riley, the dicky seat is open, so that'll be a very similar arrangement to on the AC here. I'm carrying this look on this look at some wonderful pre-war cars. We have an Austin 7 Ruby facing the AC and the Riley. A lovely little Austin 7. Quite a late example of the Austin 7. Of course, the, it can trace its roots back to 1922, but this will be mid-1930s, somewhere like that. 1938. It's a very, very late example of a ruby. Of course, you could get the big seven as well by that point in time, which was a four-door car, still with the same seven-horse engine, and a little bit underpowered by all accounts. But this is the ruby, the evolution of the original Austin 7. Really lovely car. Next to its rival of the day, the Morris 8. This is a Series 1 Morris 8. Series 1 cars had these chrome radiator surrounds and the spoked wheels. This is a two-door car. So this was uh, Morris's response to the Austin 7. Prior to the Morris 8, he had the Morris Minor, the original Morris Minor. And here we have an early Austin 7, a sporty Austin 7. This is an Ulster, or probably a replica of an Ulster. Recreation fitted with the Ulster style body some six years ago. Donor car was originally a standard saloon. Back in the early 1930s, Austin would actually sell you a car that looked like this as new. The, the Ulster, or the EA Sports, as it was officially called in the Austin sales catalogues back in the day. They did do a few supercharged ones as well, but there's not so many of those around. Most were unsupercharged. And here we have a BSA, a 1936 BSA Mulliner coachwork. Mulliner, of course, did much of the coachwork on cars such as Daimler's and Lanchester's. And in this case, BSA, they also did Mulliner um, quite a few uh, coach bodies as well, if I remember correctly. <laughs> These men use Shell, you can be sure of Shell. And there's an Austin 7 lubrication chart. A particularly nice Vauxhall car as a dealership sign for Vauxhall cars. Yeah, you can certainly see the sporty nature of the Austin 7 Ulster. The outside exhaust there down the side. Very, very sporty indeed. Much, much lower than the Morris 8 and the Ruby that's parked alongside it. Yeah, what a great little collection of pre-war cars we've got upstairs here at this particular motor museum. Quite a few nice badges as well. And the rear three-quarter view of that glorious Sunbeam Talbot drophead. That really is an elegant little car. Not very big at all, but it's a four-seater. So that'll be perfect for runs to the pub. You can always tell a quality car when you've got a proper window set in to the soft top that's always a sign that you're looking at a decent car proper quality car but this this little Wolseley it's just a stunning little car this or the AC which one would I have I don't quite know possibly this one there's the temperature gauge the old calometer as they were often called There's one of those two gallon petrol cans that I was talking about. This is a Pratt's Motor Spirit can on this particular car. Yeah. What do we have here? Yeah, this is the Talbot Samba 1985, a convertible version of the Talbot Samba. So, got slightly more modern cars here as well in the museum. The Hillman Imp, the rear engine Hillman Imp alongside that. These were built up in Scotland. And oh, 
there we go we're talking about a40s we've been talking about a40s quite a lot on this trip and here we've got a mark ii so this is the facelifted revised version of the a40 farina which first came out in 1958 called farina because it was the first of bmc's collaborations with pin and farina the italian styling house so they took the running gear of the austin a35 with its 948cc engine and uh, came up with this the sharp sharp lined austin a40 farina and these were built all the way through until 1967 got a catalogue in the window there for the countryman version with its lift up rear tailgate And this is the fifth Austin A40 that we've seen in the few days that we've been down here in Devon. Like I say, I did do a separate video of the other cars we've seen here in Devon. So please look out for that one at the end of this particular video. We'll be talking about A40s a lot more in that one. Right, and here we have the Austin A35. So this was a forerunner of the Austin A40. Same running gear, same, well, very similar engine. The Mark II, the early ones were 948, then it went to 1098cc. The A35s were always 948cc and 803 before that, and the A30. And there's its great rival of the day, the standard. Is this an 8 or a 10? This is the standard 10 from 1955, so very similar age to the A35. This has got Triumph's SC engine in it, and if you've watched the other videos on the channel, you'll know we're a big fan of these little standards of the 1950s. Our own little standard 8 is from 1956, and that's got the 803 engine, but this had the 948 engine. Slightly larger version, slightly more powerful, but not all that much more. This one's used for a bit of historic rallying, by the look at road rallying. Well, so we've got a modified dashboard there. We've got a, looks like a Spitfire, perhaps, Taco, a rev counter. Extra gauges, timing gear over on the side over there. Yeah, great little car. This engine, of course, carried on for many years after the standard 10 went out of production. You had the standard pendant for a little while, which was a refreshed version of the standard 10. And then the Triumph Herald came along, which was a very, very different car construction wise. This is a monocoque, no chassis. Whereas the Herald had a separate chassis and that came along afterwards, amazingly. But it still used the same basic engine as in this, the standard 10. Yeah, what a great lineup of classic cars. More classics the 1950s here, 50s and early 1960s. Uh, lovely motorcycles. We've got a Triumph here. We've got a VW Beetle, a much modified Volkswagen Beetle. 1972, this one. But these can trace their roots back to pre World War II. And the Frog Eye, the Austin Healey Sprite Mark I again. Very, very modified, lots of extra bits and bobs on this one. And like the A40, these were largely based on the running gear, at least, of the Austin A35, 948cc. Many people have put the 1275 engine out of later Spridgets and Midgets and the Austin Healey Sprites, the later cars. But these started out with a 948 engine, twin carburetors, but otherwise very similar. I don't think I've ever seen a soft top before with clear panels let into it. I've never seen that before. A hot rod sprite. I wonder what the story is with that one then. There's Reg Imri with his 1958 sprite. No prizes for guessing why these are often referred to as frog eyes. Or in America, the Bug Eye, the Bug Eye Sprite. For many, many modifications on this particular car. Both of these exhibit many, many updates from their owners, just to try and personalise the cars a little bit. I've never seen a, a mascot like that before on a Volkswagen. And this was owned by the same gentleman, Mr. Reg Imray. And you can clearly see he was very, very fond of modifying his cars. The GT Beetle. <laughs> so many modifications. Nice Norton. Wow. 
Wow. Ooh, I'll have to have a look at the back of the little frog eye. Look at these little fins that have been grafted on. Wow. <laughs> This is just the kind of car that would have featured in maybe Car Mechanics magazine in the sort of late 50s, early 1960s. There was a section, a couple of pages would be given over every month to readers who sent in photographs of their much modified cars. And I'm sure Reg would have sent in a picture of his 1958 Austin Healey Sprite. So many little goodies, gizmos bolted on, extra badges. Yeah, wow. Very, very personalised. It's even got his own luggage on the back. What a great pair of vehicles. Clearly this Beetle is very well travelled. Great that these two have survived together and are now on display here at Morton Hampstead Motor Museum. Fantastic. And now would seem an appropriate moment to have a look at some of the motorcycles on display here. Here we've got a motorcycle and sidecar combination of Russian job apparently. A Neval, a Neval. Got a boxer engine, very reminiscent of that, fitted to BMW motorcycles for many, many years. Let's carry on round here, got another motorcycle and sidecar combination here. Is this an aerial I think? Yep, aerial. The BSA alongside again. Are these Watsonian, these particular sidecars? Watsonian was one of the most prolific makers of sidecars back in the day. Got a Royal Enfield here, the old British built Royal Enfield. This is 19, let's see, 1955 or 1953, 1955 International Six Days Trial. Mm, so it's had a bit of a competition past this one. Some photographs there. And on mum's side of the family, and they hail from Mid Wales. And her uncles, my great uncles, who lived in Mid Wales at the time and sort of just after the Second World War, they set up between them the International Welsh Two Days Trials. So they were big fans, big exponents of off road trials with motorcycles. So it's nice to see this one here. And looking so original as well, complete with the original, what they used to call pudding basin crash helmets. <laughs> That's really great, that survived. Of trials machines, we've got a Triumph here and a DOT, a DOT. DOT stood for Devoid of Trouble, if I remember correctly. There you go, DOT Villiers engine, yeah, Devoid of Trouble. Apparently, I'm not sure if you'd get away with calling your motorcycle or anything that now because it kind of implies it'll never break down, but never mind. Now, a beautiful matchless motorcycle here with Watsonian. There we go. The Watsonian sidecar. So, if you couldn't quite run to running a car back in the day, many people got away with using a motorcycle and sidecar combination, especially if there's only like two of you. You can certainly fit one of you in there. A few bags for the weekend away. You could travel pretty much anywhere in the country, given the time. Well, there wasn't much in the way of weatherproofing, but then again, the motorcyclists didn't get anything in the way of weatherproofing either, so why should the passenger? But they did at least get a screen. What a beauty that is. Lots more old motorcycles, many of them British, so we've got an aerial. I'll just have a quick scoot along here, the Douglas Dragonfly. Again, with a boxer engine. Royal Enfield. A Francis Barnett. These were small engine motorcycles, very popular, very economical little models. Many people who were starting out with motorcycling opted for the old Francis Barnett. 
Another one there. The Greaves, they were popular trials bikes. A Velocet, mighty Velocet. We used to have one of these, a 500cc Clubman. And got a Vincent alongside that. Beautiful bikes. Yeah. My uncle restored one of these a few years ago. We ended up with it. I haven't got it anymore, sadly, but it's a beautiful, beautiful bike. The Venom Clubman. I believe the, the Venoms have these curved down pipes, but the, the Venom Clubmans, they're more swept back than this. It has got the uh, rev counter take off on the side of the case there, which is a Clubman thing. But yeah, on Clubmans, typically the downpipe would be much more swept back than that. This is a standard Venom downpipe on this one. With the Velo there. Very low geared kickstarters on these, on these certainly on the 350s and the 500s, like this Venom. They can be a bit of an awkward thing to start. Then we've got the water cooled Veloset LE, popular with police forces. Another earlier Veloset here, great to see so many Velos here. Another one there, Sunbeam, a beautiful Rudge, the Rudge Special. Harley's doing his video as well, AJS, proper early vintage AJS with the hand change on the side of the petrol filler tank, petrol tank there, and all days, yeah. is that related to all days and onions, I think it probably is, a new imperial, a Douglas, I've got a photo of my granddad sat on the Douglas, very similar to that, and how about this? tricycle with engine assist <laughs> wow well, that's pretty groovy so instead of fitting an engine within one of the bike's wheels you just attach this on the back <laughs> that's fantastic what a great thing that is I could see myself bombing around on that an auxiliary fire service matchless here in the end. <laughs> Good morning. Just have another quick look along the top row here, another Franny Barnet. This one 1925 Model 4, 147cc. Again with the side gear change there. Yeah, how cool is that? An Ajax 1923 Ajax Ladies Model, 147cc. Or Villiers engine as so many of these lightweight bikes had. Use Wakefield Castrol XL. Lovely looking things these early motorcycles. I love the detailing on them. This is a Wolf, a Wolf Vixen of 1936, manufactured in Wolverhampton between 1901 and 1939. So presumably the Second World War put paid to any thoughts they had of going into the 40s with a new range of motorcycles. It looks like a twin port single cylinder but twin exhaust ports. Very, very cool indeed. And an Excelsior, another popular lightweight bike, but like the Francis Barnett's. Small capacity Villiers engine. Just like the Francis Barn, it's a popular first bike choice for anyone wanting to get into motorcycling in the 30s right through to the 1950s. What's this? Another Francis Barn, it's a Kestrel of 1955. A BSA Bantam. These early Bantams had these very distinctive painted wheel rims. Obviously built to a price, no chrome unless you really, really needed it on these particular bikes. They started out as 125cc, the Bantams. They did eventually grow to, I think, 175 by the time they went out of production many years later. But this is a fairly early post-war, I think, Bantam. 
and the Triumph here. So what's that? A T20 Tiger Cub. The Beezer, the BSA, Birmingham Small Arms. And the BSA Beagle, another lightweight bike there. Introduced in 1962, 75cc single cylinder, four stroke, no, not a two stroke, four stroke, intended to replace the D1 Bantam. It would cruise at 40 miles an hour. Wow. Yeah. Really incredible collection of motorcycles, along with lots and lots of super desirable cars. Let's have a look along here. So we've got the beautiful matchless with Watsonian sidecar, Triumph, and the matchless there. AJS of Birmingham, I think. Norton. Norton again, another Beza. So what's that? An aerial, the aerial leader with all the enclosed engine. And if you don't want to get any oil on your trousers if you were commuting to work on one of these particular machines, I think that was probably the thinking behind that. It did make working on the engines that much more fiddly because you had to remove the side covers every time you wanted to do any mods on it or tuning, etc. etc. BSA single there, another one there. Uh, Bantam here, 1971. Like I say, Bantams were produced for many, many years. This is one of the latest 175cc bikes, GPO, the post office. And a lovely BSA here on the end. Proper bike with a sprung saddle. We like bikes with sprung saddles. So what model is that? 1932, model L32. If you saw the video I did at Ragley Hall a little bit earlier this year, 2023, you'll note that I did have quite a lengthy chat with a gent who had a beautiful oily ragged BSA, similar age to this one, so if you like your old uh, motorcycles, please check out that video and have a look for the BSA interview, because it's well worth watching, it's a beautifully preserved bike. Right, well I think we've probably done the upstairs floor here at Morton Hampstead Motor Museum. Let's go downstairs and have a look at some of the cars down there, because there are quite a few to choose from. I was saying before that this is quite a late example of a J40. In fact, now that I've just had another quick look around and a closer look, including looking at the number plate, this is the last J40 built. Wow. That's incredible. There's a bit of the information there. Interestingly, it mentions Joy 1 there, based on the Austin 8, 10 and the 12, and that's on display now at the British Motor Museum down at Gaydon. Hopefully by the time this video goes live, that particular video will have also gone live, so you can check that out and see and have a look at the pedal car that was based on the little Austin 8 and the 10, the prototype of the Joy cars, Joy 1. Uh, but by, by the time they went into production, the A40 Devon, was in production so uh, they decided to uh, do the pedal car based on the current model rather than the outgoing Austin 10 but yeah what a beauty that is but I hadn't realized that was the very last one incredible right downstairs more cars we're gonna have a proper look and in the end here we have the Triumph 1300 quality little car pre-dolomite nice little cars again this was an evolution of the engine that started out in the standard eight the sc the small car engine and these are noticeable because the the window winders are flush inside the door and you ping them out to wind the windows up and down then you flick them back in again i think that was probably a safety thing back in the day Any lamp for any car. <laughs> mm, great collection of old bulbs there, as we've said before many times. Great little collecting area that is, only cost a couple of pounds a time. 
you can build up a very attractive display for minimal outlay and it doesn't take up too much space either so yeah all of these old bull boxes That's quite neat, the Schrader air pump, the spark plug air pump. So you use one of your spark plugs out, plug it in, and the car runs on three cylinders if it's a four cylinder car. And the, uh, the compression from the fourth cylinder is uh, diverted into your tyre to pump it up. So that's quite a clever little invention. Other memorabilia here, we've got some Solex carburetor parts. These are the old trafficator indicators, the little pop-up indicators that you get on the often mounted on the B pillar of a car, 40s, 1950s, that kind of era. A Morris commercial badge there, off an old lorry or a van. Who remembers these clip-on parking lights? You clip it on top of your passenger door uh, window before parking up and plug it in. of automobilia, very nice automobilia in this cabinet here. Anyway, back to the cars, next to this lovely little Triumph 1300 we've got a Y-Series MG Saloon just post-war, contemporary of probably the MG TD sports car, could be a YA or a YB, I think that's a YA, because I think the YB's had slightly smaller diameter wheels, if memory serves. Quite a few differences under the skin, I believe, as well. But visually, I think it's a wheel diameter is the main difference, I think. This has got fairly large diameter wheels. So I'm fairly sure that's a YA. We've got an MG Magnet here. Very nice too. This is the ZB. There was a ZA before this. Not many differences between the two, really. That lovely sports car. Sports saloon, rather, of the 1950s. 1489 B series engine twin carburetors. Now, there are the there are the pop-up semaphore indicators. The lovely, lovely leather seats in there. Well, beautiful car. And the Walsley 680. Stand back to get that one in. So that body shell is based on the Morris Oxford MO. So the screen backwards is Morris Oxford MO. And it's got the longer front on it for the Wolseley 680 and the very proud vertical Wolseley grille there with the illuminated Wolseley badge in the middle it's very similar to the Wolseley 6 which also had the length and front end on it to accommodate the six cylinder engine these were popular with police forces and the Met down in London 1951 Wolseley 680 introduced in 1948 an upmarket version, oh there you go the Morris 6 had the same 2.2 litre overhead cam engine. So up here inside you can see the semaphore indicator a little bit better on this one. It's sticking out a little bit. A lovely comfy interior. Really comfy car to ride around in. Straight 6 engine. Can't go wrong with a straight 6. Lovely examples of sort of early post-war British cars there. Then we move into the 1960s or to be, to be strictly accurate the 1970s with this example. This is a facelifted version of the Rover P6 saloon on an end plate. So it's quite a late one. There's 2 litre, 2.2 and you also have the V8 versions as available as well. This is the 2000. Very comfy car, real quality car these were. Designed with gas turbine engines in mind. The Rover did spend many, many, many hours refining the gas turbine concept, but it never actually went into production, sadly. Although there were a few test mules were built, and most of those are on display now and at Gaydon, and again, the uh, Gaydon Motor Museum video should be live on the channel by the time you see this one. I uh, recommend watching that if you like looking at oddballs, one-offs and prototypes because at the British Motor Museum there are quite a few on display including gas turbine powered versions of this, the P6. I really like the interiors of this. Do you? Yeah, they're quite modern aren't they? Really cool 
I like the separate rear seats. I like the separate rear seats in these as well. But like the P5, they had separate sort of rear seats as well. But yeah, it's quite slick, isn't it? Very. Sorry, it just looks clean. Though. Very 1960s, isn't it? All these panels unbolt as well. Even the roof will unbolt. So in that respect, it's very similar to the Citroen DS. So uh, what you have to watch is. Obviously, the problem is you've got the inner core behind here, so you could have really good wings that are bolted on the outside, but it could be rotting away merrily beneath those, so you have to be a little bit careful if you're buying a P6. Just have a proper prod around, ideally get your hand up behind the wings and so on. Just have a good prod, so make sure that everything is as sound as maybe it appears on the surface. Right, anyway, let's carry on around here. Original. Mm, very original Mark 1 Ford Escort. This one on an H plate, that's about 1970, isn't it? Thereabouts, something like that. It looks super original paint on this one. Yeah, lovely. 1970, yep. Yeah. 1300 Super Four Door Saloon. Very original car. Dark red, contrasting maroon interior. Delivered 11th of March 1970. Let's have a quick peek through the window. This lovely original interior. Wow. I bet many of you watching this video remember Mark 1 Escorts, perhaps you had one in your family in the 1970s, late 60s or 1970s. I'm sure many of you remember those. Maybe you remember these, the Mark II Ford Cortina. This, what year is this one? It's on a J, so it's about 70 or 71. The Lotus Cortina Mark II, which was the replacement for the original Mark I Lotus Cortina. Technically, these were advertised, they weren't Lotus Cortinas. It was the Ford Cortina Lotus for the Mark II, because these were built at Ford, whereas I think the Mark I's were assembled at Lotus. Yeah, yeah, well, the Mark I's were assembled at the Lotus plant factory at Hethel, but I think the Mark II's were assembled at Dagenham, the Ford plant at Dagenham. That was the difference, I think. Yeah, supplied by Hughes of Exmouth. Kept by its previous owner for 30 years, subject to a total rebuild in the late 1980s. Yeah. The Cortina Lotus. Twin cam engine hiding away under that bonnet. Next to that, a Morris 1300 or the 1100, one of the two. A two-door car, that particular one, the ADO 16. Then we've got a PA Cresta, the Vauxhall Cresta PA. And then... Oh, no, this is nice. This is one of my favourite post-war cars we've seen so far. The glorious E-Series Vauxhall Wyvern. What a belter that is. And it says for sale. Oof, good heavens. Very, very tempting. Over here we've got a Riley RM, the one and a half litre Riley RM saloon. Lovely quality car. Still very coach built. Beautiful interior, lovely Slightly worn leather trim in this one, just how we like them. And the wooden dash, sporting saloon, the post war sporting saloon, the one and a half litre. There was also the two and a half litre cars available as well, open and closed cars. This, despite appearances, is a closed saloon. A beautiful car. And we've got a Jaguar D type replica over here, short nosed D type. And the sporting number at the end here is a Derby era Bentley of the 1930s, mid 1930s. Glorious petrol pump behind that as well. That is lovely, isn't it? Back past the Riley again, just to have another look at this Vauxhall Wyvern. So this is a four cylinder car. The Velox had the six, and then there was the crest at the top of the line, often with two tone paint and so on. And this is the four cylinder Wyvern. Beautiful looking car in silver. Very similar looking in many respects to the old Vanguards, the Series 1, the Phase 1s and 2 Vanguards from the front. And the early examples of these had double side hinged bonnets, so you could open it from one side, like the old Buicks, post-war Buicks, so you could it would open that way, or you could close it and then it would open that way if you wanted it. So that was quite clever. Well, they dropped that on the later E-Series. This is an E-Series, but the later cars, they didn't have that feature. And like it says, it's actually for sale, this one. I wonder what the price is on that. Mm. Beautiful interior, You've got the column gear change as well. Little radio there, little wireless radio. A few books, picnic set on the rear seat as well. Everything you could possibly need to recreate a 1950s picnic trip to the countryside. 
next to the wyvern we have this glorious and pretty rare armstrong siddley four door now is this i'm gonna to have to check in the models is this the 234 or 236 i can't quite remember let's have a look 236 there we go rare car let's have a quick peek inside this one as well I like these little marker lights Again, a few period goodies inside. <laughs> My goodness me, there's some memorabilia in the back of their picnic sets. There's a shaving set over the back there. Good heavens above. Wireless. The Remington Rollermatic Deluxe. Maps. Coins. All sorts of things. A nice bowl hat as well. Very, very nice indeed. That's really cool. Look at all these old. While we're here, let's just have a look at some of these old petrol pump globes. Good heavens. We've got the Sphinx mascot as well on the front of the Armstrong Sidley. Now, oh, here's a nice one the Austin A105 Westminster, the Vanden Plas version of the Austin A105 Westminster of 1958. A big straight six engine under that bonnet elongated front compared to the A50 Cambridges that sold alongside it but this was very much top of the tree if you popped into your local BMC garage 2.6 litre six cylinder engine this is the luxury version of the Westminster which in itself was quite a plush car and this is a Van den Plas version fairly original unrestored example that's a rare rare car that is that would be just perfect for a 50s trundle out Short production run, the A105, three years, 1956 to 1959. And the luxury Van den Plas version is very rare indeed. Only 500 were made, including this one. And it believed that there are only five of them still on the road today. The same engine as used in the Austin Healy 106, made it to a four-speed gearbox with overdrive on third and fourth. Just short of 100 miles an hour top speed. Wow. That is a seriously rare car, that is. What a great lineup of 1950s cars. It's interesting to do the comparison between the sort of early to mid 1950s, such as these, and the PA, the PA Crester on the end here. So, like I say, you had the E series, this silver car, and it was replaced by the PA series. And how different is that? I mean, there's sort of hints of Americana on this particular car, the earlier Wyvern. But Voxel went berserk with the Cresta, the PA series Crestas and the Veloxes, often in two-tone paint schemes like this one, the wraparound windscreen. Much lower as well, you can see the much lower roof line compared to the two cars. So yeah, a very different kettle of fish this, the PA, the replacement for the E-series Voxels. Pretty rock and roll, pretty wild looking car. Shame they rusted so badly. I mean, there's so few of them have survived now. Yeah, pretty groovy bench seat as well. So you could fit six of you in here reasonably comfortably. Like I say, you've got the wraparound window as well, which is, looks pretty cool. The downside is you could easily clobber your knee when you clamber in and out. So that was a bit of a downside with that particular American inspired bit of styling. And yeah, there's that little ADO 16 on the end, the Morris 1100. Yeah, what a great lineup. I do like this Wyvern. I could see myself in that. And we just wander down here past the super rare A105. And hiding down here is a little, oh, what's this, a little special. It's got a Triumph badge on it and Triumph front suspension. That front end looks very much like a Herald or a Spitfire. Worked on those many times in the past when I went through a period of owning Spitfires, so it looks fairly similar to that. And here we have an estate version, or rather the Austin A40 van, the 10 weight van with added windows. Yeah, that's, that's a very bonny machine indeed. I went through a period going owning A40s, I had an A40 Devon car and couple of vans and a couple of pickups over the years none anymore now so let's have a look see what it says 
This vehicle was converted by my father, Alan Child, about 55 years ago. <laughs> yeah, so it started out life as a van, then windows were added, as was a rear seat, which we can just about see. Can't quite, can just about get through here, if we're careful. 1954, this particular van. Beautiful leather seats. Column change by this point in time. The earlier A40s were floor change. Our 49 Devon was still on floor change at the time, which I actually preferred, if I'm honest. Yeah, very, very nice. A friend of mine's got quite an early A40 van in his shed, which is midway through doing work on. This is fairly late with the mainly painted front grille. The earlier vans had the Devon style Mazak shiny chrome grille. This is fairly late. These were sold alongside the Somerset. So even though the Devon was replaced by the Somerset car, they didn't really update the commercial versions. They just carried on producing the A40 Devon style vans, pickups and countrymen. Right, let's carry on and have a look down here. Singer Gazelle. This was the upmarket version of Roots' Hillman Minx. This is quite a late car with a squared off roof line. The earlier versions had curvy windscreens and a curvy wrap round rear window. But just as they did with the Super Minx, which also started out with a curvy window, they did square things off a little bit, and that's what we're looking at here. Alongside that, a very purposeful looking MGC. Good heavens above. Very reminiscent of the works races of the late 1960s, the GTSs, bubble arches, the enclosed headlamps, a yeah, replica of the MGC GTS. There's some nice period photos of the MGC race cars on the old classic car website. If you can make your way to the image archive section, you'll see those on there. And here we have the Jowett Javelin Saloon. Very advanced little car, produced in Bradford in Yorkshire for a period of time, but problems with gearboxes on these saw the company go under eventually. They're also well known for producing the Bradfords, the little vans and the pickups and so on. You had the Jupiter sports car as well, very similar running gear to the Javelin Saloon, but these were really advanced, quite aerodynamic for the time. Really, really advanced car for such a small manufacturer, they really did push the boat out with this one. They did a basic and they did a deluxe version of this particular car. Different dashboards. Let's have a look in this one. I think this is the deluxe. All sorts of interesting little design tweaks on these. The rear parcel shelf, which you can't really see on the deluxe versions. The rear parcel shelf could be removed and it would clip. Oh, there you go. And it'll actually clip in as a little picnic table on the back of the front seat. And then when you finish with it, you can unclip that and put it back under the rear window again. And it had a double sort of cantilever opening boot lid as well. So you didn't have to stoop too much to get in the back. So that was really, really well thought out cars these were. There's the engine down there. Radiator behind the engine, a boxer engine. Jowett Javelin. And over here near the entrance, we'll just go around the front. This is a Morgan, a drophead coupe version of what was known as the Flat Rad Morgan. Flat Rad because it had, compared to most Morgans that you see, a flat radiator that you can see there. So, what year is this one then? About 50 ish. 1954 drophead coupe. That's quite a row. On the drop-air coupe has the proper, probably lined roof. The regular soft tops wouldn't have had a lined roof, but the drop-air coupes probably did. We've got a pretty wild special here. Not quite sure what we're looking at here. It's got a V8 engine. It's pretty wild, whatever it is. Yeah. Many, many signs, old petrol pumps, memorabilia. We do approve, but we haven't finished yet. And over here we have the Rochdale Olympic, the fiberglass bodied Rochdale Olympic. Very natty little sports car. There was also the Rochdale GT, 
which looked very similar to this. I think they had BMC engines, if I remember right. 1962, that particular car. And here, behind it, the Triumph TR2. A four cylinder petrol engine under that particular shapely body. Of course, it became the TR3 a little bit later with a very small grille and the TR3A, which had the wider grille and outside door handles. But on the TR2 and the 3, there was no outside door handles. So you had to pop your hand in here and open the doors from inside using the inside door handle. Yeah. Very natty little sports car rival to the MG, well, the TF and the MGA, I suppose. Nice registration number, good to see that still on there. And an XK150 fixed head coupe, the Jaguar. Beautiful car, last of the original XK Jaguar line. A very swish. Straight six engine, of course, the XK engine, which powered so many thousands of Jaguars over the years. The Sunbeam Alpine. Roots is rival to the MGB. This is on an E-plate. That's 1967, January to July of 1967. Fairly late example of the breed. Yes, yeah, so we've got a bit of a sports car area here. The Rochdale, the Triumph, the Jaguar, which is more of a GT. Sunbeam here. And for total contrast, a nice early console Cortina estate, no less. Wowzers, look at that. So the later cars were badged as Cortina, but the early ones were badged as Consul, as you can see there. And that's, that's a very, very original looking car, that one. I'm guessing this is a Super with the uh, different colour roof and uh, stripe down the side. And of course some of them had this wood effect as well. We saw one of those at Tatton Park Classic Car Show in the 2023 video, if you haven't seen that yet. Many, many goodies on display inside here. What a super original car this is. These old Fords are super popular now. And the estates, they never seem to last very well. I think they're sold in far fewer numbers compared to the saloon versions. Making survivors like this wonderful example here. Quite a rare thing to see now. What a cracking thing that is. How has that survived? Right, let's go and have a look over the other side. Apologies for my squeaky shoes. Yeah, this is neat. Perspex windows in the Rochdale. Very sporty, very lightweight car as well. And it's got a KL heater built into the centre console there. Ooh. Very nifty little car indeed. Again, Perspex side windows as well. There's that XK. Have a quick peek inside that, can't we? BRG cream le uh, green leather interior, Basto sunroof. Yep. Chrome wire wheels. Four owners from new. 3.4 straight six twin carbs. 210 brake horsepower. Very nice indeed. There's that uh, D-type wrap over there. If we work our way past this sporting Bentley of the 1930s, we have a Farina. The MG Magnet, based on the big old BMC Farinas. So this would have the 1622, I would have thought, engine with the twin carburetors. What a cracker that is. Looks in really lovely condition, that one. What a great car that is. Again, let's have a quick look at the info. So we've got a 59 MG Magnet Mark III. Fewer than 19,000 miles from new. What a rare, rare survivor that is. The big fins of the early BMC Farinas. We are the 59 Cambridge Mark II. This is the oldest vehicle here. It's... Um Lovely. This was a sporting version, if you like, the sporting saloon. The MG Magnet we saw over the way there, and that was the predecessor to this, the Farina MG Magnet. But yeah, rare car. You don't see many of these, they've all rusted away, popular with banger races as well. Still are to this day, sadly. Unfortunately, this one has escaped their grip. 
it's still got beautiful original slightly faded paint which just looks absolutely perfect what a cracking car that is and over here something very very different similar color but this is the french hotchkiss what a stunning car that is real quality car pre-war car french lovely looking car indeed you can't really get round it's on the ramp but Yeah. Lovely detailing, it's got a Boyce motor meter, the temperature gauge there. There's the Hotchkiss badge, crossed cannons, Hotchkiss of Paris. Of course, Hotchkiss also produced the Jeeps in the sort of 40s and 1950s. Oh, beauty, that's it. 1930 Hotchkiss AM2 Chantilly. Don't often see those in museums in this country. Let's have a quick look round here. More gems dotted around here. Look at this delivery, oh, delivery van, I suppose you'd call it. A three wheeler motorcycle based delivery van with the cargo compartment on the front. So you've got twin, twin wheels at the front, steered with the, the sort of load box there on the front. Wow. What a nifty little delivery vehicle that is. What's this? The body styling book of a Bristol 410. Now, I've not read the information yet, but I've got a feeling this came from when Bristol Motors closed down a few years ago. There was a big sale, and I seem to remember seeing photographs of this body styling book. So the aluminium body panels for the Bristol 410 would have been formed over this. This was the former, the wooden former, if you like, over which the panels were folded. Yeah, how cool is that? And again, great that it survived to dis be displayed here at the Moorhampton Stead Museum. <laughs> oh, proper craftsmanship. The days of craftsmen built, coach built cars. AC plug doctor, spark plug doctor here. I think if I was going to spend my retirement messing around with old cars, I'd love a place like this. If I had the money and the time, I would definitely set up a motoring museum and hopefully it would end up looking something like this. But take very deep pockets to start a collection like this now but if anyone's got a building going spare let me know <laughs> anyway right Rolls Royce so 2025 apparently this one started out with a 20 horse engine not brake horsepower 20 horsepower RAC rating and then was later upgraded to a 25 or engine 25 horsepower engine the car itself dates to 1929, coachwork by H.J. Mulliner, and the Wayman Saloon, and then this is a Railton, these are powered by the American Hudson engine, a straight eight, in fact I found one of these in a barn just a few years ago, one very very similar to this, this is just post-war, again coach built. This is 1946, yep, Railton Straight 8, the big old Hudson engine, big dependable old plodder, side valve. <laughs> lovely, lovely car. Blue Mel's Brooklyn steering wheel there. Now 
And this on the end here is a De Dion Bouton miniature Charabang. Yeah, this Hotchkiss is a pretty magnificent looking car. Just look at the shape of that radiator surround. Absolutely beautiful style. Lovely curved bonnets. The barrel shaped bonnet, I suppose you'd say. Very nice standard Triumph uh, sign at the back there as well. Oh, what a treat this museum's turned out to be. So if you find yourself in Devon, make your way to this little town. Check the opening hours, of course. But yeah, I would certainly recommend popping into this lovely little museum because it's well worth the trip. Some real rare things here. And that's what we like to see. Some of the cars are for sale. Love these old Saddler teapots. Well, I think we have probably viewed everything in the Motor Museum here today. And what a cracking place it is. Well, well worth a visit. Whether you like your pre-war cars, saloons of the 1950s, such as we can see here, whatever your taste, it's well worth popping into this fantastic collection here in Dartmoor. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Please check out some of the other videos on the channel. Well, there will be many more videos along before very long, so bye for now. So, young man, what would have been your car of choice there? The Rochdale Olympic. The Rochdale Olympic was your choice, was it? Yeah, it was a bonny little car, that was. I did like some of the pre-war cars, I must admit, but post-war, I think I would be very tempted with that A105 Westminster, the Vanden Plaats. Yeah, I'd probably have the XK150 before that, though. Would you? Probably. Ooh, controversial. I know. <laughs> controversial. It is a nice car. It's a very nice It'd car. It'd be a good cruiser. Both it was. Them. Yep. Anyway. Definitely, definitely worth visiting uh, Morton Hampstead today. What a cracking museum. Indeed, a cracking little town.